This interview is with Fritz Forer, born November 14th, 1931 in Belgium, served in the Royal Netherlands Air Force from 51 through 56 as a jet fighter, pilot, and captain. This interview is taking place in Fairhope, Alabama on July 26, 2011. I am Lori Dubose, manager of the local radio station. This interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project and the American Folk Life Center at the Library of Congress. Fritz, very nice to meet you. Same here. Pleasure to be here. You were born in Belgium, but then moved to the Netherlands in the Depression era. What was that like? What was life like then? It was the biggest mistakes my folks ever made. Uh, my mom and dad were both born and raised in Holland. But my father was moved to Belgium for the company he worked for and started up his own business. And in 37, when my grandmother died, they got talked into taking over the business, the hotel, cafe, restaurant, along the German border. And that was at the worst of the Depression. We darn near starved to death. As a matter of fact, the place got foreclosed on uh, later on. And from there on in, we were renters of the property rather than owners. And uh, the main thing I remember about the Depression is how little we had and how little business there was. And in the beginning, 37, 38, a lot of Jews streamed across the border with baby carriages, wagons, some cars. Uh, but Hitler stopped the influx in 39, so no more business came across the border. And a lot of the Jews stopped in our restaurant. It was the first, practically, the first restaurant inside the border. And they'd come in to eat, so we had a certain amount of business. But when Hitler closed the border to the Jews in, in 39, that was it. Um, the main thing I remember as a kid, it was very poor. And when I wanted one lousy penny to buy some marbles, my dad said, I couldn't have a penny unless all the kids get a penny. So we didn't get a penny. Uh, that's how poor it was. Then when we were invaded by the Germans, uh, things changed drastically. But that's your next question, right? Yes, tell us about that. Um, on May 10, 1940, all of a sudden the Germans overran Holland, Belgium, Luxembourg, and France. And we were so close to the border that we were already occupied before we woke up. When we woke up a little bit after four, the Germans had already passed us by uh, their uh, Punter to uh, tank train had already rolled by us. They didn't get stopped till they got to the rivers, 30, 40 miles further down the road. But we were occupied immediately without a shot being fired. And uh, that's where my story begins, five years under the swastika. Be begins on that very day, that very morning at four o'clock in the morning, when we all of a sudden had Germans in the house. Uh, we went to school, believe it or not, because my dad said it's a school day, you go to school. There was nobody there, obviously. Uh, only one other kid showed up and the headmaster. And instead of going home, we hung out in the marketplace and the Germans had upset, set up their soup kettles to feed the troops. And they acted like they were on a picnic of sorts and we ate with them, we moved around with them. And uh, meanwhile, in our cafe, German officers had come in they came into the backyard in their open car, and they ordered steak and eggs and coffee and beer and cognac, and they paid for it. And we took in more money that day than we had taken in in a whole month before that. So all of a sudden, it seemed like we were coming out of the Depression, which is indeed was the case. Uh, there was no more unemployment, obviously, in Holland all of a sudden. The, the factories opened up. Everybody had to go to work for the German war effort and the economy spruced up. And for a while, the relationship between the Germans, the occupiers, and the Dutch was pretty congenial. And a lot of Dutchmen became Nazis. The, the, the Holland had a, their own uh, Nazi party, the NSB. Uh, and about 15% of the Dutch people became Nazis, although that wore off after a while when they started rounding up young men to work in the factories, and a lot of young folks, young men especially, didn't want to work for the Germans. 
and uh, disappeared into the underground and started sabotaging the Germans, which of course resulted in reprisals and people being executed. So that love affair at the beginning of the war wore off kind of rapidly, and especially when the Jews, about a year, two years into the war, the Jews had to wear a Star of David, and they couldn't go to school anymore, and we had a sign on our restaurant for Yoda Verboten, Jews not allowed. Uh, they couldn't ride a bus, couldn't sit on a park bench, and then they rounded them up little by little, always in the middle of the night, until there were no more Jews in town. So you can imagine uh, the relationship between the Dutch populations and the Germans deteriorated rapidly. You went from almost an awe at a 10-year-old to the, the shock and fear just a few years later of the transformation? Um, as a kid, it didn't sink in as such. To me, anything that happened was exciting. Anything was exciting. Being bombed was exciting. The Jews being rounded up was tragic, but it was ex exciting. I didn't see the war and the bombing and the occupation the way the grown-ups did. I thought it was more exciting having German soldiers in the house than uh, living as a civilian. And we had German soldiers in the house from the very beginning. We had a, a bar and a restaurant. And uh, I grew up with all the German drinking songs and marching songs, and by the time I was 10, 11 years old, spoke German fluently. And in my mind, the whole war was exciting. When you wrote your book, Five Years Under the Swastika, did that perspective change and look back as an adult? No, because when I wrote it, what brought that about, I was a guest speaker at AFA, the Air Force Association in, uh, in Tampa. And I gave my talk about what it was like. And when the talk was over, my audience were bombardiers and gunners and pilots from the 8th Air Force who had bombed Holland and Germany. And they said, man, that is funny. You ought to write a book about it. So I wrote the book and I gathered up all the pictures and talked to my brothers and sisters. And I called the book, War is Fun, because that's the way I had seen the war and everything with it, especially when two things happened. One was we grew up with the idea of stealing from the Germans is not really stealing. That's only taking back what they took from us in the first place. So that gave us a lot of leeway. And you won't believe all the things, unless you read the book, you won't believe all the things that we stole. But it gave us license to steal anything that wasn't attached, as long as we could get away with it. And then the second thing happened, after the Garden Market exercise in 44, September 44, the bridge too far, if you remember that, mm -hmm. we didn't go to school anymore. So all we had to do was bum around. My father and mother were busy. They had five kids, and they had a cafe and a restaurant to run. They didn't have much time for us, so they gave us a lot of liberty. And we just bummed around and hung with the German soldiers. and generally enjoyed ourselves. So I saw the war from an entirely different viewpoint and I'm asked sometimes, were you ever afraid? A couple of times when the bombs came a little closer, uh, the American bombs it is, because the Americans uh, and, and the British, they bombed the living dickens out of us. The British at night at first, or the British, the first bombardment was by the British during the day in, in uh, in June of 41, before America was even involved in war, we were already being bombed on a daylight raid. And later on, when the Americans got involved, the British bombed at night and the Americans during the day. Now, the big bombers, the B-17s, B-26s uh, and so on, they came over at a high altitude and they bombed Germany. They only bombed us locally if a plane was shot up and they dropped their load in order to limp back to England, and then the bombs uh, would hit our town. But generally, our town and our railroad tracks were not big enough a target for the, for the big bombers. But the fighter bombers, they were out all the time. When the sun was out, and thank God Holland has a lot of lousy weather. We don't have sunny days, but 100 a year. But when the sun was out, 
the fighter bombers would be there, especially the Americans, the P-51s, P-47s, and they bombed the living dickens out of everything. The Germans even had a slogan for them, because it would come out in two formations, echelon formations of four, and the Germans called it, which means, there they are, the loyal eight, the standing guard over us. Because when the sun was out, the Germans couldn't move not the wagons, the trains, because the fighters would come and bomb and strafe the heck out of them. And I thought and that inspired me to, to say, when I grow up, I'm going to be a fighter pilot, because that's what I wanted to do, shoot the dickens out of things. And that's what you did. Let's move to 1951, when you were drafted by the Royal Netherlands Air Force. Right. You became a jet fighter pilot. Right. And you flew some of the first active jet fighters the U.S. produced. Tell us about that experience. Yeah, we were sent to the United States for training, and the first jet we flew was the T-33, which is the training version of the F-80. And the F-80 was actually the first combat jet that America had and flew in Korea. And then the F-84, which was a single-seat fighter, straight fighter. And those, uh, the F-84 was the main plane that I flew. Uh, once we graduated in Tucson after learning how to f shoot air to air, bomb, rocket, strafe, uh, we were sent back home to Holland, and for the rest of my career, I flew the F-84 around, which by then was kind of an an antiquated, because America had F-86s, F-89s. We still had old F-84s. Did you, uh, were you in a plane that went down, or lose comrades from that? Comrades, yes. I buried 11 of my buddies, and none of, com because of combat, so that's why I'm a little out of place sitting here. I'm not a veteran who was involved in any kind of war. I never shot at anybody, and nobody ever shot at me. So, because I was 14, going on 14 when the war was over, so, I was never involved. We didn't go to Korea. Uh, the Korean War had kind of stopped in the middle of uh, 53, and we didn't get our wings till October of 53. The Americans who graduated practically all went to Nellis Air Force Base to get checked out on F-86s, and practically all of them went over to Korea in F-86s. We, uh, foreign students, we went uh, through F-84s and back home. So I was never involved in combat. But jet engines and jet planes were so new that uh, we had more accident than you can shake a stick at. And uh, 11 of my buddies, over a period of a few years, crashed and died, and we buried them. Uh, mostly, just like it is now, mostly pilot error. Uh, some mechanical problems, but misinterpreted. Mostly pilot error. But uh, uh, I personally never had a major problem. I only had to make an emergency landing twice. I had never, in 54 years of flying, never made a bad landing. So I'm hardly in place here as a combat veteran because I never had any such problems. You served as an apprentice, if you will, of, of trying out, the, learning the new planes and learning how to operate and being prepared in case. Oh, I did want to go to Korea. I volunteered several times. But the Royal Netherlands Air Force said, uh uh, in the first place, they didn't have a contingent in Korea. Uh, the Dutch that were there were attached to a British contingent. But when we applied for Korea, they said, no, you first have to come to back to Holland and be trained. They acted like the American training wasn't good enough. And they weren't kidding. They put us through three, four more months of training in Holland before we were considered combat ready. Uh, and I must admit, we needed the training. It was good for us. But we never got into action because the Korean War was over. And that was it. And then you eventually came back to the United States. In 57, I came back as an immigrant and uh, have been here ever since. And I'm obviously still here. Yeah, uh, when I got out of the service in Holland, just about all of my buddies went to airlines, KLM, Martin Air started up, Lufthansa started up, Swiss Air, 
because it was the beginning of the jet age. The commercial jets started flying at 59, and every airliner wanted pipe people with jet experience. But I was not the best of military guys. If I hadn't left the service, they would probably have kicked me out. And I never wanted to wear another uniform. I never wanted to say yes, sir, or no, sir, to nobody. And that's why I didn't join any airlines or what have you, even though we were in demand. The but you only did get your commercial and instructor's ratings. Yes, but all private. And, and I didn't get into a uniform till much later uh, when my son was uh, starting college. I heard about the Civil Air Patrol. And I had taught my son, I had my own plane by then, I taught my son to fly since he was nine years old. A couple of phone books under his butt and a pillow behind his back, and by the time he was 15, he soloed, and I taught him. And I thought he could put in more time with the Civil Air Patrol, and I went to talk to him, and they needed me. They needed somebody with an instructor's rating because the pilots have to be checked every year. They needed a check pilot with an instructor's rating. So guess what? I got back in the uniform, and I did a lot of flying. Never got paid a cent, but I had a good time flying around and checking these various people and going on different rescue missions, but uh, all in, in, in good fun. It's different when it's an auxiliary and you're a volunteer, and yeah. isn't it? And all of your experience led you to write another book called The Fun of Flying. Tell us about that for just a moment. The, the Fun of Flying is a little R-rated. Imagine Be that. <laughs> because you're going to wonder what was most important to us, learning how to fly, chasing girls, partying, or chasing girls, or learning how to fly, or drinking, or chasing girls, or all of the above. Man, we had a ball. The experience of being sent to the United States for training, coast to coast, stationed in North Carolina, Texas, in Arizona. Um, was generally a ball, and we had only two things on our mind, uh, flying and chasing girls. And uh, I couldn't think of anything better to do. And that's what this is about, and it's a fun book. Well, you were you, in your you, early you, 20s, so yeah. I would say. You You'll laugh a right lot place. when you read this book. Anything else that you want to mention? You've obviously had quite a different experience and perspective than many other veterans that have been interviewed for this program. But it's still an important part of the story to tell, don't you think? Yeah, our experience during the war was interesting for one of one reason. We had German soldiers in the house at all times, and people asked me frequently, what were German soldiers like? They were like American soldiers. They came in the bar to drink and eat and dance and uh, sing along with the, the records. Uh, ordinary guys, the Nazis. The fanatics, those were the problem. The ordinary German soldier, they would rather have been home with their wife and kids rather than be in this lousy war. So that was one good experience, learning the difference between an ordinary soldier and a real Nazi. And then later on, after the war, we had lost our house. We lost everything. I should go back to that and explain that. We had uh, two British soldiers in the house for uh, seven days. These fellows had not been out of their clothes for nine days straight. The fighting and moving and fighting and moving that crossed the Rhine and Patton and the Americans continued further east and the British swung to the north and they came into Holland from the east. And these guys had been on the go constantly for nine days straight. And my mom learned one English words, word when she wash their underwear and towels, she would say, nice, and they'd say, nice, Mrs. Ford, nice. <laughs> it's the only English word she ever learned. But we learned from those guys what it's like to be a foot soldier, and right outside our town, nine British tanks were clobbered, so several British soldiers got killed right outside our town, but we left out. The fighting went around the town instead of through the town. It could have been a lot worse. If we had had door-to-door -door fighting, we would have been in bad shape. But the reason why we were not in our original house, in, uh, in the fall of 44, all of a sudden, 
a German staff car came into the backyard and a German engineer, Herr Hauptmann, and his staff, including a young girlfriend, came into the restaurant and they told my, my parents, sit in Zigi, sit down. And from now on in, if we take over the restaurant, you will be closed to the public. We will put straw on the floor, all the furniture has to go out. We take over the rooms upstairs, and we will put Russian and Polish prisoners of war in here. We will cook for you, we'll bring the food, and the good news is we will bring a generator and you will have electricity again. What are you going to do? Uh, for six months, we had German soldiers in the house, sleeping upstairs, and uh, Polish and Russian prisoners of war sleeping on the floor, on straw, in the restaurant, what used to be the restaurant. And the good thing about it was, while all of Holland was starving to death, we had food. We had to cook for all these people. My mom and a, a big fat Obergefeiter, like a sergeant major, he was the cook. They worked in the kitchen and they had to f feed everybody. So we had food, we had electricity. We had it made in compared to the rest of Holland, because some 90,000 people died of hunger in Holland after September of 44 when they didn't get that bridge too far. Well, we had food, but then in February, early February of 45, my father got into an argument with Herr Holtmann somewhere in the restaurant, and the conversation went a little bit like this. My father said, you wait a few more weeks and the Americans will be here and they'll get your butt. And Herr Hauptmann said, hey, you won't live to see that. And he pulled his pistol out and he was gonna shoot my father right on the spot. My mom jumped in between, got it all settled, but my dad was arrested and cut it off. And my mother who grew up right on the border spoke German fluently. She went to one headquarters after the other or get, trying to get her husband back. And there was a curfew at the time, eight o'clock at night, you had to be in the house or you get shot. Well, mom wasn't home at eight o'clock, mom wasn't home at nine, mom wasn't home at 10. Mom didn't come home till after midnight. Thank God nobody shot at her. And she said, your dad will come back, but we have to move out. Where are we gonna go? They don't care, we have three days to get out. We can only take pots and pans and bedding for our own use and all the rest we have to leave. And they, the Germans was very particular. They got an accountant in and took inventory. They signed everything and they had Holtman signed a note how much they owed us, 63,000 mark for all the inventory. But we had to move on. And with a bar hand card, we went down the street. Well, the town was half empty anyway because everybody had moved out. They lived in the farms left and right. If you're from here, you'd move to Alberta and stay on the farm because if you were in Fairhope and were bombed every day, you would get the heck out of town, right? Anyway, the town was half empty and my brother and I broke into a few houses, empty houses, and uh, by climbing in through the back windows and opening the front door and we got brought our mother over to look at him and mom selected one of them and we moved in. And that from there on in, we were in the same boat as everybody else in Holland, no water no electricity, no coal, no gas, no food, nothing. And the only choices you seem to have is, are you gonna die by freezing to death or are you gonna die of hunger? Those were our only choices. But all of Holland was in that same boat because uh, in 44, when the guard market exercise took place, our, our queen had gotten on the radio and people supposedly had no more radios. Everybody had to turn their radios in, except us because we had a German soldiers in the house all the time. The queen got on the radio and she said, we are now in Eindhoven, we're in Nijmegen, we're in Arnhem, and tomorrow we expect to be in Amsterdam, and next week I'll set foot on soil in Holland, and please help our efforts by upstaging the Germans as best as you can, go on strike and sabotage as much as you can, and they did. Trains went on strike, power companies went on strike, everybody on strike, so all of a sudden, there's no more transportation, the Germans only ran the trains for their own good, they said, it's your problem. No more food, no more clothes, no more coal, no more gas, no electricity, no more nothing. So all of a sudden, in February of 45, 
we were in the same lousy boat as everybody else in, in, in Holland, in what was still occupied Holland. One third of Holland, the lower part was liberated. The northern two thirds remained occupied. And as a matter of fact, the Germans didn't surrender that part till May 5th, just three days prior to VE Day. So all of a sudden we were in the same lousy boat as everybody else. Did your father come back? Oh yeah, my father was back the next day. He helped us move. So my father's back, and uh, my oldest brother uh, was kind of tall. He was 15, but he looked like he was 18. If he showed his face in the street, they would pick him up and send him to a labor camp. So he couldn't show his face in the street. My father couldn't show his face in the street because the same thing might have happened. So they couldn't do anything. So it was up to my younger brother and I to provide food, coal, and wood for the family so we'd survive. At the age of 13 or so. How did you do that? By applying what we'd learned, stealing from the Germans is not really stealing. We didn't have many choices. We stole a lot of food and, and coal, what have you. But in town there were warehouses, the Germans called them Brot Ausgaben. Brot means bread. And the Germans had these hard loaves of sour bread, very dark, and it lasted forever. Even if the bread was mildewed, you could cut off the top part and eat it. And they had stores and stores of it, and it had to be distributed to all their camps around town. And the German soldiers would pull up with little trucks or with their uh, uh, horse wagons and load up bread to bring to their camps. And these had to be loaded. The result was, in the warehouse, they needed people to load bread. And we pick two loaves of bread, pitch it to the next guy, and so on, form a long line. And for every wagon we loaded, we got one loaf. So we'd come home most days with two, three loaves of bread, most days. Mm -hmm. um, we had uh, an arrangement with a farmer uh, where every day one of us, my sister, my younger brother, or I, my older brother couldn't show his face, we'd get on my mom's bike and with a gallon can, a metal can, we'd go get milk. And since we had been dealing with that farm for a long time, and we had booze at the time, having a restaurant and a bar, so we had been trading with him mm -hmm. for a long time. The old bar so system. every day, somebody would go and get milk. So we had bread and milk, and then some of the items we stole, and some of them uh, are hard to believe. If you read the book, you still won't believe that a young boys would break into a building where there was a time bomb, was damaged by a bomb, and there was a time bomb down there, or it was a bomb down there. Uh -huh. We didn't know if and when it was gonna explode, and it was boarded off by the Germans. But we'd go in there and load food and bring it home, and then one incident, one night, we were roaming around. We had two sleds, my dad had built sleds. We, the winter was terrible. We had a winter that was three, four months long, and packed snow everywhere. So we had sleds with which we could work our way through the streets. And we were roaming around, and in one of the big houses where the Germans were stationed, we were trying to uh, steal a radio from my father, because all of a sudden we had no more radio, and to see if we could bump some food. And as we were sitting there chatting at the kitchen table and having some soup with the German soldiers, two officers came in and said, whose sleds are in the driveway over there? And, uh, ooh, sorry, uh, if we're in the way, we'll move them. I thought they wanted to back out a car or something. And they said, no, 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 no. We've got to go to the station. We have bicycles, and we need our suitcases at the station. Now, here's a cigar for you, for your papa, and here's a couple of guilders for you. Now, would you boys be kind enough to bring these suitcases to the, to the station? So here, my brother and I, with the two sleds, our ropes over our necks, we marched out in the direction of the railroad station. And that's the funny thing, we never said a word, he or I, we understood one another so well. At a given point, we simply made a left turn down the street into an alley, another alley, and before you knew it, we were home with three suitcases, and it was like Christmas in the middle of February. Uh, all sorts of stuff, all sorts of clothes, beautiful boots, officer's boots that my father could wear, and. Uh, uniforms that my mother could use to make clothes for her children. This was, that was one of the best tricks we pulled at that time. And for uh, more of these stories and adventures,
look for Fritz Forer's books, the five years under the swastika, the fun of flying, and you went on to do some murder mysteries as well to continue your adventurous life. Yep. After I was through writing about myself, I decided to start writing mysteries. And I'm intrigued by the Mossad, the intelligence outfit of the Israelis, because they've got guts. The FBI, CIA, um, tobacco and alcohol control, so uh, the conspirators. And I'm intrigued by the fact that the Americans organization didn't work well together. The Israelis are much more efficient than the American intelligence. And you know about that major shooting people at Fort Hood, um, which could have been prevented, and the shoe bomber landing in Detroit after they had 10 warnings. Uh, some of these things are degrading. But I put all of this together and create suspense stories. And uh, there's a lot of truth in it. Uh, by coincidence, I have a book in my possession written by a Dutchman who operated a flight school in Venice, Florida, who trained 20 Muslims, the terrorists, that flew into uh, the Twin Towers. And now in his book I learned because I thought the FBI and the CIA were just plain stupid, not knowing that if somebody comes to a flight school and plunks down $30,000 and says, I want a commercial license, they say, well, wait a minute, buddy, where'd you get the money from, right? No, the CIA and the FBI were aware of what was going on. In the book that this Dutchman wrote of the flight school, because he was interrogated after 9-11, you can well imagine, by the FBI, the CIA. They were aware of what they were planning, and that Mohammed Atta, who had been in the Israeli jail until he was released uh, and came to America to organize all of this, that Mohammed Atta found out through their intelligence sources that the CIA was wise to their efforts. And that the CIA was prepared to cut them off before their October attack on the tower, so they moved it up by a month and did it in September. Mm. And you actually went on to write another bo uh, book to address what happens after. Well, Fritz, for it's been a pleasure. It's obvious that your life has been an adventure, and your adventure continues. Yes, thank you, you very right much. here. Thank you so much. Thank you.